thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, I guess, if you're calling in from the West Coast. Again, Michael Smith, Executive Director of the My Brothers Keeper Alliance here at the Obama Foundation. On behalf of President Obama and the entire My Brothers Keeper Alliance and Obama Foundation family, I would like to welcome mayors, local elected officials, all of your teams and our partners um, to our Reimagining Policing Pledge virtual workshop series, uh, which we are proud to co-host with our partners and friends at Cities United and the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Uh, this workshop series is a part of our Reimagining Policing Pledge, which President Obama launched last month. Uh, to date, more than 200 mayors have publicly committed to the pledge, uh, and we're currently vetting hundreds more uh, that have been submitted on our website. Um, the first workshop that we have, a part of a three workshop series just to kick us off, uh, was really about what to do when you're starting this journey of reimagining policing. Uh, what are the reviews and the reforms that you should be thinking about when you're looking at use of force policies or going even further? Uh, we'll have a third workshop uh, that we'll announce for next week that will be focused more on what does a community review process look like that is really authentic, that is engaged, uh, and that's not always you know, activist and elected official on, on both sides, but how do you create a real conversation? Today's workshop, uh, the goal is to take us further in the journey from where we started last week. And we've gathered a group of highly acclaimed activists, organizers, and change makers to really help you explore the wide spectrum of policing and public safety options, um, alternative public safety models, and community-centered uh, review processes. Uh, so excited about the folks that, that we've gathered today. And so let me dive right into the conversation. Uh, we don't need to do much more introduction. Uh, we're, we're gonna go ahead and get into this conversation so that we can hear from our panelists and then have an opportunity uh, to take your questions and to hear from you. Um, so first uh, joining us today is Patrice Cullors, who is an artist, organizer, and freedom fighter from Los Angeles, California. Um, you all probably know her as the co-founder of Black Lives Matter, uh, the Black Lives Matter Global Network, founder of Dignity and Power Now, and the founder and chair of Reform LA Jails. Um, you know, just a few weeks ago, the New York Times posted an article that said Black Lives Matter may be the largest movement in U.S. history. Uh, and it's always an honor when I have an opportunity to be with Patrice or Alicia or, or Opal. Um, these are women that have made incredible breakthroughs and really changed the game uh, for black lives and changed the conversation about how civil rights is done. I know Patrice uh, worked on the getting in, in, in good trouble, the good trouble documentary. And I, you know, I remember a few years ago when we were with Congressman Lewis, um, he said, you know, people always tell me they're standing on my shoulders and I tell them to get off of my shoulders and to get to work. And so I think Patrice is really the embodiment um, of that. And so we are just so proud uh, and honored uh, to have Patrice with us today, um, who has just been fighting for the, the lives of, of, of Black folks for, for so long and continues to get in good trouble. We also have Judith Brown Dianis, who's the executive director of the Advancement Project. Uh, Judith has served as a lawyer, professor, and civil rights advocate in the movement for racial justice for many years. Uh, she is hailed as a voting rights expert, a pioneer in the movement to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. Um, and she leads the Advancement Project's national office's work in combating structural racism in educating, education, voting, policing, uh, criminal justice, and immigration. Uh, before she took on this mantle, she was a managing attorney in the DC office of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Um, and for those of you that, that don't know, um, Advancement Project's national office works with grassroots partners uh, to significantly decrease student suspensions and arrest. And specifically, they're working in communities like Denver, Baltimore, uh, and school districts throughout Florida. And we were honored to have a chance to work with Judith during the Obama administration um, on My Brother's Keepers and the Department of Education's Rethink School Discipline campaign, uh, where I think we really helped to change the conversation about the way that we uh, expose our children to discipline uh, and the incredibly disproportionate ways that black and brown children uh, face discipline in our school system. So excited to have Judith here uh, talk about those perspectives. We also have David Muhammad, who's the executive director of the National Institute of Criminal Justice. Uh, David provides leadership and technical assistance to the ceasefire gun violence reduction strategy in places like Oakland and Stockton, uh, California, Portland, Oregon, Oregon, and Indianapolis. Um, uh, David has done a lot of work with the federal courts, monitoring reforms in Illinois, um, uh, 
also in um, the Antelope Valley monitoring team and, and with Los Angeles. Uh, he's the former chief probation officer of the Alameda County, California Probation Department. He was a deputy commissioner of the Department of Probation in New York City, which is the second largest probation department in the country. Uh, he was a chief of committed services for Washington DC's Department of Youth Rehabilitation Service, the first executive director of the Anti-Recidivism Coalition in LA, and was the executive director of the Mentoring Center in Oakland. You would think he's 105 years old with all that experience, uh, but you'll see we've got a young man who is still very much in the fight. Uh, and then lastly, my colleague that I have the pleasure to work with closely every day and who's also a co-host um, of this series, Anthony Smith, uh, the first chief executive officer of Cities United. Uh, Cities United was co-founded by former mayors Nutter and Landrieu in 2011 to really serve as a national network of communities focused on eliminating violence in American cities related to African-American men and boys. Uh, Anthony was also the former director for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods in the office of Mayor Greg Fisher in Louis Louisville, Kentucky, um, and uh, has been a seasoned leader in these spaces for over 20 years, uh, working on organizing, facilitating, managing, and mobilizing networks, including places like the Network for Community Change, uh, the Jefferson County Public Schools, and Louisville Urban League. So I told you we had an esteemed panel of experts, and I, you know, I, I hope you can see that, that we've, we've kept that promise. So let's go ahead and dive into this conversation. I want to start off with Patrice. Um, you know, Patrice, you have come to the work of police reform from a very personal place. Uh, you've spoken publicly about members of your family, uh, including your brother and father, who have experienced harm by law enforcement in the criminal justice system. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how your personal experience has shaped your opinion um, on what public safety looks like uh, in the United States of America. Thank you, uh, Michael. And I'm so grateful to be here uh, and be in conversation with this team um, in this moment. It feels um, different this time. And I think uh, it's not often that a generation gets to witness um, their impact multiple times. Um, and so in the last seven years um, with Black Lives Matter, um, we've obviously seen you know, thousands of young Black leaders, not just take to the streets, but engage in um, rigorous strategy and approaches around how we deal with the harms in our community. And while police violence and police terror is um, one, of the, one of the many issues we're talking about. I think um, personally, it's one of the most important issues for a generation that grew up during the 80s and 90s. Um, you know, my generation that spent a lot of time witnessing our families and our loved ones be decimated by over-policing and over-incarceration. And so I often start with my story. I'm from Los Angeles, California. Um, I actually hail from the valley, the San Fernando Valley, still a part of LA City for people that don't understand that. And um, I grew up in Van Nuys, California, small working class suburb outside of the inner city. And uh, what I witnessed and what my family witnessed, um, no family should have gone through, no family should have experienced. Um, my mother was a single mother who was raising four children and really trying to grapple with um, living in poverty, as well as dealing with the onslaught of police harassment. Um, my earliest memories of police were not fond. Um, in fact, my earliest memories were police raiding our home. Um, my earliest memories of police were um, stop and frisking my siblings and their friends. And if you know, I take a moment to think about it, um, I'm, I'm often shocked and alarmed because we were children. Um, and the part of this conversation that is often lost upon us is the impact over policing and over incarceration has on children. And so I spent um, much of my childhood um, questioning, questioning why our family was experiencing what we were experiencing and questioning why nobody was trying to save us from the police and save us from the, um, the carceral system in Los Angeles. So I, I start with that because um, in some ways, um, much of the work that I do has everything to do with wanting to save my family's life. Um, it was never uh, a political issue. 
It was about how do I make sure that my family is not harmed? How do I keep them safe? How do I protect them? Um, and then, you know, how do we get food on our plate and how do we get stay sheltered and how do we get our basic necessities? Um, that really led me into my organizing work. Um, while the first organizing work I did was actually around climate change um, when it wasn't trendy, um, I only went into climate change work because I was organized by a local grassroots organization. And the first thing I asked them was like, do you do anything around policing? And they were like, nope. And I was like, well, I'll just join you anyway. I, I was so hungry and thirsty to be a part of something that was making change and challenging structural racism. You know, we are um, given an opportunity right now. Um, I always see, see these moments um, of national rebellion, of uprising as an opportunity to change course. Um, we have an opportunity right now in this country to reevaluate the ways in which black communities and poor communities have been engaged with for the last 50 years, 100 years, 400 years. Um, we have an opportunity to really have um, um, ask ourselves serious questions about the police's role in Black communities in particular. And we don't actually have to argue anymore that most Black people are saying, hey, we need something different. This structure does not work for us. In fact, it is incredibly dangerous. It is incredibly harmful. And so I've really put this very simply, you know, a lot of people have been scared. What do they mean about defund? Is it going to be the purge? Oh my God. No, you guys. No, it's not going to be a purge. Um, what we're actually asking for is a reallocation um, and a reimagining of dollars, uh, reimagining and a reallocation of how we understand what safety looks like. And so I always put it very plainly, which is, our communities are safe if they have access to food, if they have access to shelter, if they have access to adequate public education, and if they have access to healthcare. And it is not safe if our communities are only given access to a gun and a badge and a jail cell. And that is the unfortunate reality. And so if we zoom into a city or a county like Los Angeles, that over the last 30, 40 years, what we've seen, the trend, the upward trend has been more police, more cages, more police, more cages. That actually hasn't matched more education, more health care, more food, more access. In fact, more police, more cages has gone up and people's ability to have access to the basic, basic necessities has gone down. And so we're in this um, moment where we have to question what we've allowed our communities to have, what we've allowed our communities to engage in, what we've allowed our communities to engage with. And the question that Black Lives Matter and our larger movement for Black Lives are asking is do police keep us safe? No, they do not. And so what is the answer? What is our answers? And I think the questions for lawmakers, for, for mayors and, and for city council members, for county, county board of supervisors and governors is to ask that question. And I would say engage your community um, in a way that's authentic engage your community in a way that keeps them safe. I think it's really um, one, one thing that I'll say, um, because I have a, a captive audience, you know, at the early stages of the Black Lives Matter, people kept asking us, just sit, just have coffee with the police, just have a conversation with them. I promise if you have a conversation with them, everything will change. Well, that means that people don't understand how structural racism works or how, um, um, organized violence works. You can't just have a conversation with an individual officer and assume an entire structure is going to change. No, we have to have a new relationship to these structures and we have to be bold and courageous right now around how we approach these structures. And so early on, you saw that we were uh, pretty stubborn about not sitting with police. We, we said, this is not about individual officers. It's not about individual chiefs. This is actually about an entire system. And so we have to have a systems approach in this moment. And I'm excited because I feel like seven years later, we're kind of doing it. And this, kind of, this conversation opens up a new avenue for us to engage the system. Patrice, that's really helpful. You know, it's interesting, uh, leading the work of My Brother's Keeper, both in the Obama administration and now, I always feel like I'm walking this fine line between the world of activists and the world of reformers. And you've been called an abolitionist. You, may, you might even use that term yourself. 
but you also say that you're a fan of non-reformist reforms. So I'm wondering, as you're talking to local elected officials, what is that balance between abolishing, ending, re completely reimagining, and also taking the reforms that, that get us to that point? How, how do you encourage um, elected officials to think about that spectrum? Yeah, um, great question. And I definitely identify as an abolitionist, uh, but I also identify as a strategist. And so I don't believe that you can get rid of something overnight. I think you have to take steps to get there, to reimagine a world where we all can live safely and we all can get our basic needs um, taken care of. And so um, when I say non-reformist reforms, I really mean um, well, when we're trying to build a new world for Black people, um, that doesn't include harm and violence by the state. We are really looking at what are the ways that we can build towards reform that get us closer to freedom, but also build towards reform that doesn't reify or put more money back into harm and violence, put more money back into the state. And so for a long conversation, for a long time, we had a conversation about police body cameras as if a police body camera was gonna be the one thing that's gonna keep us all safe. And that if we just put it on camera and we just showed the truth about what was happening, then the police will be accountable. Well, we've seen what a police body camera does. There's two things that happen. One, if they turn the camera on, we do see the abuse. We've seen it over and over again. Has that actually changed the system and the structure? We can all admit that it has not. Two, um, we are trusting the persons who are in a structure of violence to turn on a camera and be accountable. Um, that often does not happen. We learned in South Central that there was a whole crew of LAPD officers that just turned off their body cameras. They would show up to a scene and then all of a sudden the cameras would, would be off. And so we have to have a new kind of conversation. Um, the conversation to reallocate dollars out of police budgets. So why do we have these bloated police budgets? What does it look like to right size the role pull money out and put it back into communities, that's a non-reformist reform. And so that's where we are sitting in right now. We're in this really incredible moment where many mayors and city councils are actually engaging in a non-reformist reform. One thing I'll say um, before we pass it back to my colleagues is um, stay strong, stay courageous, stay bold, because I promise you, the minute you start making changes in your city, the police and naysayers will start coming after you. Us activists, we're used to that. Mayors, you may not be, but it's okay. We got your back, we will, we will have your back, the community will have your back. We just need you to stay strong because we know that the long-term vision that we're building right now is a vision that's gonna keep us all safe. And I think that's what matters most. Thanks Patrice uh, and uh, participants feel free to start uh, putting questions in the chat box. We're gonna to come to a conversation with you uh, soon, but I don't want you to forget questions you might have for Patrice before we go on to, to others. Um, so let's, let's take that conversation to you, Judith. Uh, you have been working on this path from non-reformist reforms uh, to abolition. If you think about the school discipline work, um, all the way from potentially removing school resource officers um, from schools. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, Judith. What is the data um, that shows the challenge that we're having uh, when it comes to school discipline for, for black kids especially? Um, and, and what is the data that supports potentially changing um, the way that we think about policing in our schools? And Judith, you'll just need to unmute yourself. There you go. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so thanks, Michael, um, first of all, for having me as part of this conversation. Um, you know, um, when we started Advancement Project in 1999, um, we were doing work around school discipline. And um, we came to that issue because Black communities were finding that children were getting inadequate education, but that there was this trend that they were actually being pushed out of the classroom. Um, a few years later, we figured out that there was a more ominous trend beyond what was happening with suspensions, which was around uh, the police being an actual direct pipeline from the schools to the juvenile justice system. And so how this plays out is that, of course, 
with police and schools that are either SROs, and we have our school districts, some school districts that have their own police departments. Um, our SROs, there are about 10 to uh, anywhere from 10 to 20,000 of them in our schools. We don't have an exact count of SROs, um, but that's not including police and additional security. What we do know is that the the more likely young people are to be arrested. Um, while black students are 15% of student enrollment in public schools across the country, they're 31% of arrests and referrals to law enforcement. Black girls who are 17% of enrollment are 41% of the girl arrests. And so what we know from doing research over the years, from being part of a movement for police-free schools, is that uh, we have done everything that we've done in the criminal justice system, we have done in our schools. That if our communities don't trust police on the streets, then they're not going to trust them in the hallways of the school building. Um, that young people are not only being criminalized for things like disruption of a school function and disorderly conduct, but they're also um, being touched by excessive use of force in schools. Uh, so we have a website, we came to learn doc. So I, it looks like we're, we're having some trouble with uh, Judith's line. Is, is, is that correct? Is, or is that just me? Yeah. So Judith, I'm going to go ahead and I'm, I'm going to actually uh, go and, and, and take the next question with David. And so hopefully my team can work with you um, and get you back online, either through the phone or, or, or figure out what's going on, uh, because we definitely want to hear with what you have to say. So hopefully you heard what I just said, Judith, but uh, I think Adam and Stephanie will be following up with you to, to get you online. So let's, let's go to David Muhammad. Um, you know, we started this conversation on the kind of the path to really reimagining, and David is leading an effort to do a massive expansion of, of credible messengers. Um, we, we've been talking a lot. So what does the alternate, alternate look like? If, you know, if police are doing everything, um, and actually with My Brother's Keeper, we support credible messengers across the country. We, we support uh, some of the cure violence work and advanced peace work. And so, David, I'm, I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit more about what are these alternate strategies? What is this credible messenger um, effort? And how does it balance and potentially even do better at times uh, than, than, than policing? Certainly. Uh, thank you, Michael. And very good to be with you and the Obama Foundation and the My Brothers Keeper Alliance and, and all of the, the administrations from around the country. Uh, we are certainly at a time where we have to go beyond just eliminating chokeholds and, and other kind of extreme uses of force, things I thought we had already done, to be honest. Um, and I, I appreciate this discussion of moving the ball forward and really looking at effective alternatives. Um, I try to uh, have a framework around some of this reimagining police and the what I call RIR, uh, re reduce, improve, and reinvest, uh, reduce the footprint of law enforcement, improve significantly what is re what remains, and reinvest uh, money into community solutions, community response networks, into community services. Uh, and we have proven methods. And so um, starting in Oakland many years ago that were initially called transformative mentoring, uh, was working with young people coming out of the state juvenile justice system um, and then in New York, uh, implementing transformative mentoring through the Young Men's Initiative um, in the Bloomberg administration, um, and uh, which developed into what was called ARCHES, uh, still uh, today in, in, in New York. Uh, ARCHES received a pretty detailed uh, evaluation that showed uh, young uh, men who went through, who were on probation, uh, on adult probation, but young folks, uh, 16 to, to 25 or so, uh, who went through the ARCHES program uh, had more than a 50% reduction in recidivism than uh, the very similar situated young person on probation who didn't receive uh, the intervention. Pretty extraordinary uh, outcomes uh, that has been expanded to Washington, D.C., 
kind of rebranded as Credible Messenger Mentoring. Um, and uh, we at the National Institute for Criminal Justice Reform are involved in several initiatives around the country to bring this type of work. So let me just give it a little explanation. Uh, so for instance, in the city of Oakland, uh, which has a, a pretty innovative funding initiative, I think many other cities have been interested in, it's a ballot initiative where the voters approved uh, a, a, a primarily a parcel tax. Uh, and that parcel tax funds about $10 million, just shy of $10 million a year uh, in violence reduction services. And so a city of about 420,000 people just from city government is $10 million a year in specifically violence reduction initiatives. There's a separate fund entirely for prevention services and youth development services. This is specifically around violence reduction and a large portion of that money funds what we call life coaches. These are credible messengers. Credible messengers are people with similar lived experiences as the people they're serving, people who have credibility with those folks that they're working with who can be an inspiration and a motivation to them. Uh, and we took that sense of credible messenger and mentoring and then really structured it to be a life coach so that you have in the city of Oakland 14 full-time life coaches who their sole job is to be in a relationship with people who have been identified as the very highest risk of being involved in gun violence. And so there's a whole process of identifying the very small number of people in the city who have a very high likelihood of either being shot or shooting someone. And then we connect them to these credible messengers, to these life coaches. Um, and 14 people, all of whom formerly incarcerated, who've turned their lives around, who've been tr trained thoroughly in the credible messenger and, and, and life coaching process, who work with about eight to 12 people at a time uh, for six to 12 months potentially up to 18 months in a very structured way. And included in that is a small financial stipend to the client uh, to incentivize connection uh, and achievement. Uh, it's been extraordinarily successful. Uh, in Oakland, we've been able to sustain a 50% reduction in shootings and homicides over the period of seven years. Um, there's never been that type of sustained reduction ever in the city's history. Uh, we've had an outside evaluation by Northwestern and Northeastern universities that show that this initiative is the primary cause uh, of that reduction. Uh, but similarly, I'll, I'll just say last, in, in Stockton, California, We've done the same initiative. We're starting in uh, Portland and Indianapolis, and we're just getting started uh, very new in Washington, D.C., working with the ONE's office, Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement. Uh, and so we're, we're excited about this. Obviously, at this time right now, where you're seeing the combination of a global pandemic and a national crisis around uh, uh, the, the behavior of police, and you have added to that to have some, an increase in uh, shootings around the country, which is, which is not since the protests. It's been since the COVID shelter in place. And I think it's important to note that. Um, and so we believe that uh, the last thing I'll just say is scaling. So in Oakland, we have 14 full-time life coaches. We have about another 10 violence intervention interrupters who either respond to the hospital when someone is shot or try to mediate conflict. It's a very robust program. But in Oakland, there are 2,000 times a day someone from a resident of Oakland calls for a police response for some reason or another. Now, the police don't respond to all those calls, and neither should they respond to all those calls. But there we need to scale up a community response network that responds to people who want some sort of resolution to their problem. And even the people calling don't necessarily uh, need a police officer. In fact, the vast majority of those calls, they don't, but they want some sort of response. And so we have to be able to invest and scale up a community response network that can respond when the citizens of these cities, the city, the residents of these cities uh, are requesting some type of resolution to their issue. Now, 30% of the time, that's a non-criminal thing that they're calling for, 30% of the time. So if we can eliminate that entirely, in fact, I've talked to about 15 police around the country around this, uh, the executives and police, none of them want to engage in that uh, work, right? And that's a 
good chunk of the current work of, uh, then you add to that uh, cold calls. You came home from vacation and realized your house had been burglarized or a, a low level uh, um, uh, criminal activity. If you add all of that up, you have a significant amount of time that police are engaged in work that can readily be re uh, uh, responded to by community trained community responders, let alone the serious work of violence intervention that can also be significantly reduced by credible messengers. So there is a host of community actors who can be effective alternative uh, to law enforcement engagement. David, that's really helpful. You know, you've got mayors and city councils that are actively looking at budgets right now. And so when you think about how these sorts of resources that supplement or supplant um, traditional police enforcement, what, what would you advise? Uh, what, what should the numbers look like? What should the balance look like um, yeah. if, if cities are beginning to think about budgeting and supporting this in the right way? So a couple of things. So another example, the city of Oakland, uh, uh, the city government asked me to co-facilitate a process. So they're creating the Reimagining Police Task Force. Um, and my organization, as well as Policy Link, are co-leading and co-facilitating that process. Uh, and we're getting a host of community members, uh, as well as experts in the field, including a law enforcement on that task force, to say, to ask that very question. Right? What, what's the footprint uh, that we can reduce immediately? Uh, what over time can we build up and scale up a community response? Uh, and it, and it, one of the things it starts with is a real assessment of the calls for service uh, to, that come into the police department. Uh, and so when I'm referencing some of these figures, of about 30% of all calls. This is a national study of, of several police departments around the country that is representative of the, uh, of the country. About 30 to 35% are non-criminal calls. You have another 15% to, that's a traffic and others uh, that you can really look at. Point being, you really need to assess these calls for service and what police do. The vast majority is patrol and responding to 911 calls, although it's not the only work that they do. There's some self-initiated work and a bunch of units that aren't that aren't radio cars, as they say, they're not responding to 911 calls. Um, but you have to be able to have the same type of investment. I, I'll ask you a question this way quickly, Michael, is I think it was the researcher Patrick Sharkey who wrote a piece in the Washington Post uh, who said, if you look at the city of Washington, DC, which has an extraordinarily high police to resident ratio, um, and you, they break their beats down in something called PSAs, police service areas. Every police service area has about 12,000 residents in it. The police department spends $10 million in each of those PSAs and has about 70 personnel. What could intervention workers, interrupters, outreach workers, credible messengers, life coaches, what could they do much more effective with ten million dollars and twelve to serve twelve thousand residents? Right. I think it could be extraordinarily more effective and safe. And so, one idea is to pilot something more immediate like that. Take a section of the city, have a significant reinvestment into community response network. Obviously, have some. Um, uh, uh, agreements that certain activity will have a response from law enforcement. Um, and, and let's see how we can improve the outcomes in terms of safety and well-being and, and healing in, in a neighborhood. Uh, and so and those are the type of steps in terms of assessment and piloting that we can do to get to the goal that we're all after. Very helpful, David. Um, and Anthony, let's go to let's go to you. Cities United, uh, which is working with cities to reduce their homicide rates, specifically around African American men and boys, has very specific tools and services that can help communities think about an overall public safety plan that that gets you there. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how Cities United um, helps mayors in this journey, and what are the sorts of of tools uh, that you can help them with as as they're thinking about. Uh, changing the game in their communities. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And again, thank you and the, and the team and all the other panelists for really this conversation, which is right on time. And, you know, we do tons of work with David, so it's always good to be on a call and with David uh, as he continues to build this out. And I think, you know, so for Cities United, uh, it's really clear our focus is on reducing the homicide rate of young black men and boys. And when we started the work, really was focused on community violence. Uh, but as we move through the work, 
Uh, one of the questions that Mayor Hodges, who I think is on the call, came up and asked us to start thinking through around police violence and state violence and how those intersect and how they connect. Uh, so we really come at it helping mayors think through how to build a comprehensive public safety plan. And really to Patricia's point, really around how do you redefine public safety and then how do you reinvest, right? Because at the end of the day, public safety is not about law enforcement jails and detention centers. It really is around all of the things that Patrice outlined when she started the conversation around access to quality uh, housing, access to quality education, affordable, livable wage jobs, all of those things that keeps us safe. So when we come into a city, we're asking mayors to do, to think about their work in a two-pronged approach. Really look at the things that David just outlined and what you got to put in place right now to keep young people safe, healthy, and hopeful, right? What are the credible messengers? What programs should you be thinking about? Uh, and how do you put those in place? But then what are you doing long-term to change the systems and the structures to make sure that we reduce those pipelines or reduce those cycles of violence for young people, which includes looking at uh, police and schools, as Judith was talking about, and thinking through that. So helping mayors and their teams work with their community to think comprehensively around what does it really take to keep young Black men and boys and their families safe, healthy, and hopeful? And how do we get there and what's that vision? So really taking the vision from violence prevention to the safe, healthy, and hopeful, and really putting together strategies to get us there as we think through the work. So we come in, we've got a roadmap to safe, healthy, and hopeful communities that we walk cities through and really help them think about uh, the different pieces of the work that they've got to pay attention to as they move their work forward and how they fund that and how they support that is really a part of that conversation as well, Michael. So really just helping them think through uh, the strategies and, and, the, and, the, and the processes that it takes to get there and how do you lay a vision out for the city and the community to move in that direction and it's really clear for us that you got to have the young people and their families who are most impacted at the table as we make these decisions and as we move forward. Because uh, many times you go into cities and I think with good intentions at times, uh, city believe they have what they need at the table uh, and don't pull in the, the families and the young people who have been impacted by community violence or police violence to have this conversation. And they come up with solutions and ideas that don't work and wonder why they don't work. And it's because you were not as thoughtful up front and bringing everybody to the table. Uh, and I think, you know, part of the conversation that we've been having really is what is the right size uh, that we need for law enforcement and jails and detention centers, if at all? What is the right size for those? And what does that look like? And how do we move in that direction? Uh, one of the questions you just asked David around uh, the, uh, like coming up with a cost and what does that look like and feel like? And that's one of the things that we want to help people think through. The controller in Philadelphia actually put together a report, which was the economic impact of homicides and said, if we spend this much money per homicide on prevention and intervention in five to 10 years, this is the savings that we will have, not only on saving lives, which is very the reason for it, but also saving money as a city. And then how do we reinvest that? And I'll make sure I share that with you all as you sit it back out. But there's all of these ways and methods and we, we work with mayors specifically because they can, they, they can have some really quick impact on the budget, on policies, and really move an agenda uh, forward and can be uh, really uh, innovative when they think about how they propose and how they allocate resources. And I think, you know, there's been mayors across the country, Mayor Hodges included, and others who have thought about how to reallocate dollars uh, to give resources to community so that they can create public safety strategies that they want to see and that they want to put in place. So there's all of these different plays and ways. And another thing that we do at Cities United is share those best practices. They might not be uh, evidence-based yet, but they work. And if they work, we want to make sure other people know about them. So Cities United is that network where we bring mayors and young people and community folks and other city folks together to have those kind of conversations. But there's a lot of folks moving in the right direction, but we've got to figure out to Davis point, how to take advantage of this moment and really push uh, uh, to get us to the place where we all want to be. Anthony, thank you. I, uh, that was very helpful. I just smiled because there's a lot of activity happening in the chat, which I'm excited to see the conversation happening there. And I'm going to ask one more question to, to Judith because she's back and then we'll, we'll come to conversations with the mayors. 
but I just saw someone say, I need help with my mayor. <laughs> and I think you've got a bunch of mayors that are on this, uh, on this call that could perhaps give you some solutions and some suggestions. Um, so Judith, let's go back to you. You were sharing the data about this pathway from reforms around school discipline reform to police and schools. And you know, I, I just wanna bring you back into that conversation. I, I'll tell you, you know, I'm, I, my mom had me when she was 16, and then she waited many, many years to have my little brother. 26 years younger than me. So I have a little brother that's in high school and she and I were recently talking about, you know, should there be police in schools? And she's like, of course there should be police in schools. And so and my mother's a, a pretty, I think, progressive activist person. And so Judith, if you can- I'm going to have to work on her. <laughs> I'll, I'll put you on the phone together. <laughs> so if you could help really shine a light, Judith, on right. the conversation why um, and then what yeah. what is the alternate strategy that the alternate universe that we should be looking like sure well you all know that i was saying some really profound things when my laptop seized up and had its own little seizure going on so i'll try and figure out what that was um, but so here's the deal um we should not have police in schools because Cops are cops. <laughs> it doesn't matter if they are on the street or in the hallways of our school buildings. Um, in fact, in school buildings, there is a culture clash because police are law enforcement. And so what they do in the school environment is to enforce the criminal code. So what we see are these arrests for things like disobedience, disorderly conduct, which, you know, things like that you wouldn't get arrested for if you had an altercation in a bar. If you have it in school, you're getting arrested. And so often they are called into minor events that happen in schools and they do what they do, which is to arrest a young person, remove them from the building. What we do know is that this is the, sa the same kind of data that we know about what happens to black people outside of school happens in the school, right? Young black boys um, are known to uh, be uh, perceived as older than they are. Um, this is Phil Goff, Dr. Phil Goff's research. So that means that they are held to be more culpable and responsible for their actions. Black girls are seen as less innocent. Um, so therefore they are arrested more often. Um, as I was mentioning, there have been lots of incidents of excessive use of force in schools. And so we've got to be thinking about something different. And I want people to know that this police free schools movement that is now like catching like wildfire. We've seen not only Minneapolis, but Rochester, um, Madison, Wisconsin, we've all of these school districts moving that it's not something that happened overnight. This work has been going on for a long time. Um, it's just that there's an opening to a different conversation about police and the legitimacy of police in black communities that has opened up the opportunities for some wins. Um, but a couple of things before I end. One is that we have to understand the history behind police and schools to understand why this is a problem. Um, police came into schools starting in the 40s in like Indianapolis is the first place to have police in schools. But then in the 50s, around the same time as schools were desegregating and integrating, is where we started to see an increase in police in schools in order to protect property and to build relationships. And so this, this kind of tracking of racial tensions with the introduction of police in schools is problematic. Then we see another increase with the Crime Bill of 1994, right? So all of the failed policies of the Crime Bill and the war on drugs actually played out in our schools also, leading to increased funding for SROs, led to discipline policies that started to look like the criminal code, three strikes and you're out. Also seeing things like um, broken windows theory being used in schools. So if you did one little thing, you know, if you brought your little, your little um, scouting knife to school to cut your apple, um, then you were seen as someone who would probably kill somebody next week, right? And so we got to get you out the school, zero tolerance, we need to arrest you and punish you, right? So this tough on crime attitude was brought into the schools, add to that the super predator theory, right? So in the 90s, we have super predators who are teenagers who have no conscience whatsoever, have no empathy, 
and who are willing to kill and maim people, et cetera, and who have no mothers and no fathers and no communities, et cetera. And so we see this influx of police to control them. And so important to understand that history, important to understand how we got here. Um, and lastly, so how do we get out of this, right? So how we get out of this, I, this is, I had to get back on, this is one of the most important audiences I've talked to about this because there's so many places where there is mayoral control over school districts so that um, the community groups that we work with in our Police Free Schools national campaign cannot get a school board to vote on it because it's up to the mayor. And why this is important is because our children should not be in schools where they don't trust the adults around them and they do not trust the police. And police are not counselors. They are not the mentors. There is a blurry line between the police and the mentor who all of a sudden uses a statement against a child and that child gets locked up. So what do we do? Get them out the school, the school building. Yes, when there is an incident that requires police, we call them just like we call them anyplace else. We would call them into the school environment. Every school should have a plan, right? A security plan and a, and a plan for those incidents like the mass shootings, but that we know is also not something that regularly happens. We need restorative justice programs in schools. So all that money y'all spending on police and schools, we want you to put into restorative justice programs. Those programs are not just one person in a building knowing how to do a, a circle to hold a kid accountable. What it is, is it's a culture and a relationship that is built between students and the adults in a building. So that, for example, we also know when um, there is a school shooting, everyone right away says, well, that student actually was isolated. We should have seen the handwriting on the wall. They needed help. Well, if we have restorative justice and we have strong relationships, we can flag those things without threat assessments, which are racially discriminatory, but we have adults who recognize. And so having restorative justice programs, having the kinds of supports, having counselors in school. We have 1.6 million students that attend a school with, um, with a cop, but no counselor. Um, more likely that they are black students that do not have counselors, but have cops. Um, so we need counselors. Returning to school in a pandemic, young people are going to need mental health supports. They have been isolated. They have been surrounded by death and illness and unemployment. Some of them are now homeless and houseless. And so we need to make sure that they have the supports to come back into a loving environment and in this moment, we know in America that a loving environment is not created by having police as the holders of that environment. And so we've got to be thinking very differently, applauding all the school districts that have already done this. Chicago, $33 million on the line with school police. Oakland got rid of their school police department, but now they're trying to turn around and put that money back into Oakland Police Department instead of putting it into supports for young people. And so this is the same as Patrice was saying, is if we supported our communities in a different way, we wouldn't have to rely on police. Thank you, Judith. Um, Patrice, I know you wanted to add a comment on, on this subject. And then Nicole, I'm going to turn it over to you for your questions. For those that can, we're going to hang on the line until about 15 to 20 after. This will also be available via video that we'll share uh, with folks. Um, but Patrice, let me let you weigh in. I know you've been working on these issues for quite some time. And then I'll turn it to Nicole. Yeah, I've just, I've been very like in the chat box and talking to people. Um, I love these chat boxes, they're fun. Um, one thing I just wanna remind people who are listening in is um, we are very wedded to, to structures, even if they don't necessarily work because we're so used to um, aligning ourselves with something that we've just been doing. Humans are not used to change, we're just not. And so I'm, I'm reading things on the chat and I really love that people are being honest um, but I want to remind the folks that are listening that this is an opportunity to actually come with an open heart and to really listen to new ideas that maybe you don't necessarily agree with or you don't align yourself with, but this is an opportunity to have a deeper conversation around what hasn't worked. Um, and you know, someone made a comment on here that it wasn't their experience. Um, some of what you were saying, Judith, wasn't their experience or former 
um, law enforcement officer in the school. And I said, just because it's not your experience doesn't mean it didn't happen. And I think that's what we've seen in the last seven years is, you know, for a long time, people were like, black people are just being hyperbolic about the police. People thought we were, you know, we were just like being, we were, we were over exaggerating about our experiences. And then we've seen what the police do on cameras in real life. So you can't deny those experiences. So just because you didn't see something or you didn't experience it doesn't mean that it's not happening. And I think it's really important when we hear people name harm and violence happen that we actually address it instead of trying to defend against it. Um, it will help us as we're trying to move this ship forward as um, collectively as possible.